Please rise as you are able, in body or in spirit, and join me in singing hymn number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. We'll sing it twice through. Welcome, however you meet us today, however your body meets us today, in pain, in strength, in tension, I welcome your body here. However you meet us here today, in joy, in sorrow, in hope, in curiosity, I welcome you here today. I welcome your whole self here, your gender, your race, your ability and your disability, your languages, your sexuality, your history, and your people's history. Welcome to First Unitarian Church of Memphis, the Church of the River, a Unitarian Universalist congregation in beautiful downtown Memphis on the unceded and stolen lands of the Chickasaw Nation. I am Lindsay Donnelly Bullington, and I'm filling in at the pulpit today for the last time this summer. Welcome. May we worship together and live this welcome by sharing in the tough love of covenant and of community. A couple announcements this morning. Assistive listening devices are available upon request. Please see one of our ushers or our staff will please raise their hands. 
If these items will allow you to better experience our worship service, please, please use them. Parking is available in the Channel 3 lot on Sundays from 9 to 3 for those who are physically able so we can leave our parking lot open to folks who that journey might be a little bit more difficult or to first-time visitors. For Faith Formation for All Ages, our Magic Summer programming continues for children four and older. Children attend the first part of the worship service in the sanctuary with their families at 11. Following the Time for All Ages, they may choose to follow adult volunteers to the Emerson Wing for planned activities. Summer hours for nursery care for children four and younger are 10 to 12. Children must be registered before attending, and families are invited to drop off younger children early to allow extra time for settling in ahead of the morning worship service. Of course, children are always welcome in the service um, in our sanctuary, um, and we, we know that that means that they bring um, a, they, they might bring more joyful noise or movement, and we welcome that um, for our children and for folks of all ages as well. Um, However, the, the Mississippi River Room will also be open um, and streaming the service if it would be more comfortable for a child or a parent. The church's COVID task force is continuing to monitor case rates and hospital, hospitalization levels in Shelby County. The current risk level is low, which means that masking and social distancing are optional. Um, however, we do have masks available in the back um, if you forgot yours. Uh, August 21st is River Sunday, which is the beginning of the new church year. On, uh, on the previous day, we'll ha we will have Team Up to Clean Up. That's going to be on August 20th. Many areas of our buildings and grounds are still in need of pretty urgent care. We're hosting another volunteer opportunity on Saturday, August 20th, from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., but you can come and go as you please. The weather forecast is between 74 and 91 degrees. There will be both indoor and outdoor tasks. Come for the whole day or for part of it, and there will be a free Indian lunch prepared by Prashik Mamtora for all volunteers. Kindly RSVP at dcl at churchoftheriver.org. Uh, Sign-up sheets are in the breezeway. And our shindig is returning as well. The popular Wednesday community socials are back. Join us to play board games in September with pizza, soda, and brownies. In October, we'll host a Halloween party and auction with live entertainment, food, and costume prizes. In November, we'll gather for a Friendsgiving potluck. And in December, we'll watch It's a Wonderful Life with eggnog and cookies. All events are kid-friendly and everyone is welcome. For more information, please visit the church calendar on our website. We invite all first-time visitors to fill out a visitor's form on our website. If you're interested in joining Church of the River, please see an usher or a staff member, and they'll assist you. For more details on these and other Church of the River events and activities, please email info at churchoftheriver.org, subscribe to our weekly mailing list, and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. With no more announcements, our worship service will now begin. Our call to worship this morning comes from Emily Dittar Burt. When you feel constrained, when your mind makes hard limitations, like skin pushing against a cramped space, rediscover the dirt under your fingernails, trace the veins under your skin, find the universe stuck in your throat. A cosmos stirs in your heart, connecting your trillions of cells to the infinite universe that cradles you. Life is so much more than the daily demands of our preconceived notions. You are so much more than all the stories you tell yourself. Breathe and remember the limitless possibilities held within your fingertips, the miracle of your molecules growing into someone you may not know who will be a wonder to behold.
We light our chalice this morning with the warmth of community, the light of truth and justice, the flicker of curiosity, the spark of prophetic witness, and of course, the radiant fire of commitment. In this brilliant and beautifully queer transformative potential of this flame, let us worship together. Please rise and join me in singing hymn number 1028 in the Teal Hymnal, Fire of Commitment. May be seated. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Reverend Sam Title, and I, I I work here. I promise. I haven't been around in a while. Um, but uh, Lindsay asked if I would uh, come hang out this morning, and uh, on on her last last Sunday, um, as as our summer minister and hang out a little bit. And so um, I, I told, I made up this whole story about what I was going to do, and it was not true. <laughs> uh, we're talking about Lindsay this, th this whole time. Um, 
So something that I think about a lot is um, ministry it is an endurance game, right? Ministry is, it, it is a marathon, not a sprint, right? Um, and even the most seasoned ministers will try not to go more than four weeks preaching in a row without a week off. Lindsay, how, how many weeks in a row does this week mark? Six, six weeks, which is, which is Herculean, frankly. Um, so uh, Lindsay is a, a, a brilliant minister and is a, a seminarian who our congregation is sponsoring. We are the people who vouched for her and told Boston University Theological Seminary that, that uh, you know, we believe that she's going to be an amazing UU minister, and she has given us so many gifts this summer. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and reflect those gifts, and then we're going to give some gifts. Lindsay, if you, if you would join me, please. So we are going to just shout out, just in, in one word, shouts, something that Lindsay has given you this summer, be that in the pastoral care, or in the sermons, or in anything, something. So I am going to say insight, and I am going to say joy, and I'm going to say hope. And then you all are going to start shouting things out as well, popcorn style. Love. Love. Acceptance. Acceptance. Angels. Angels. Passion. What was that? Passion. Passion. Curiosity. Curiosity. Miracles. Sweetness. Sweetness. And now what we're going to do is we are going to bless Lindsay with what gifts we have to give to her. What are we, when she is packing her suitcase to go back to seminary in Boston, what, what are the things that you would put in that suitcase along with all of the very intense books that you have to read, uh, what, what would you give her to take with her back to Boston? Love, poetry. Love, poetry. Roots. Roots. Wings. 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 Energy. Energy. Peace. Peace. Patience. Patience. Confidence. Confidence. Absolutely. So, I think that's so beautiful. I, I would echo the patience because seminary needs a lot of patience and I would add trust. And so the, the gift that our congregation has given Lindsay is we got her a beautiful clergy robe that uh, she was measured for uh, this June. It is, you know, because when it's not a million billion degrees outside clergy, we, we, we wear these robes. Um, it is a wonderful clergy robe made to her specifications. It is being made as we speak. So I don't have it to present to her this morning, but I have something to present to her that is just as spiritually and liturgically significant. And that is her very own Church of the River softball trophy. <laughs> This morning, she was like, why is there a trophy in the pulpit? And I was like, I have no idea. So, she will be getting her very own, this is from 1981, the All Memphis Fast Pitch. So, you will be get. We, we present to you this Church of the River softball trophy. I, I picked a small one because you have to move it across the country to take with you to seminary. Uh, you, we will also ship you the robe. But, in the meantime... We have uh, this, this trophy as a, uh, not so much as a, uh, a, a, you know, raise the trophy accomplishment, though it's that as well, but also as, as a, uh, a, a little manifestation of the love that our congregation has for you, for you to take with you out into the world. Thank you so much for all you have done for us, and I uh, get to go preach to these people a week from today. And uh, I am 
genuinely grateful that I get to share a pulpit with you. So, thank you. And so we're going to do this twice. First, we are all going to raise up our blessing hands to Lindsay and repeat after me as I say, you are beloved. You are sacred. You are powerful. Go in peace. And now we will raise up our hands in honor of, I don't think any young people are actually here to leave, but we're going to keep the ritual because rituals are important. Raise up our hands and think of the young people who we know and love in our lives and repeat after me as I say, you are beloved, you are sacred, you are powerful, go in peace. gave away my smile through that mask. <laughs> for our first reading this morning, please join me in the back of your hymnal for responsive reading number 549, Hymn to Matter. I'll read the plain print if you will join me for the italics. Blessed be you, harsh matter barren soil, stubborn rock, you who yield only to violence. Blessed be you, perilous matter, violent sea, untamable passion. Blessed be you, mighty matter, irresistible march of evolution, reality ever newborn. Blessed be you, universal matter, unmeasurable time, boundless ether, triple abyss of stars and atoms and generations. You Our second reading comes this morning from Anna Levy Lyons, who says that Unitarian Universalists should be more countercultural. What might these Unitarian Universalist countercultural disciplines look like? I imagine that they would be redeployments of traditional religious disciplines, the kinds of disciplines involving cornerstones like money, food, and relationships that mark a person as really religious but in this case, serving liberal theological ideals. What if, for example, those of us who have high-paying jobs refuse to accept a salary that was more than seven times what the lowest paid worker makes in our organizations, and explained to our stunned colleagues, it's because I'm a really religious Unitarian Universalist. What if starting today, we only ate food that was sustainably grown, humanely raised, and for which the workers who produced it were paid a living wage, even if that ruled out most of the food we currently eat. And we explained to our outraged children, it's because in this family, we're really religious Unitarian Universalists. 
What if starting today, and you'll know when, the, when this was published, what if starting today, straight couples refused to marry until there was marriage equality for everyone in the country? And we said to our disappointed parents, it's because we are really religious Unitarian Universalists. These kinds of disciplines, if embraced by our congregations, would form the basis for a unique and powerful religious counterculture. Unique because of its liberalism and powerful because of the respect garnered by its boldness. Our congregations would stand out as brazen non sequiturs and beacons of hope in their communities. Unitarian Universalism would gain gravitas and become a movement in the truest sense of the word. Please join me in a moment of prayer or reflection followed by a brief silence. Spirit of life, loving God, we pray first, as always, in gratitude for the chance once again to gather together, to be in community. We pray knowing that all the world's blessings are here, that all the world's blessings are around us in our lives, many in this room and many beyond it. Knowing that these blessings surround us May we bless ourselves. May we bless ourselves to recognize laughter in sorrow, a moment of joy in a time of pain, inspiration among dullness. May we bless ourselves with an openness, with a heart that knows we are always interconnected when we are alone. May we bless ourselves with the chance to change, to grow, to move fearlessly when we are deeply afraid. And may we bless ourselves when we're greeted with these many blessings already present, with the clarity to call it as it is, to name it as a blessing and to treat it and ourselves with the tenderness and appreciation it deserves. We pray knowing we are beloved that we may bless ourselves as we have been blessed. In many holy names we pray. Amen and blessed be. It's now the time in our service for the giving and receiving of the offering, for the care and sustenance of our congregation and our community. Donations may be made in the black box on the wall over the credenza via text to 901-350-2686 or on our website at churchoftheriver.org. When I'm up in Boston for seminary, I do a lot of thinking about what makes our Unitarian Universalist faith special. Many of us have learned the value of preparing what we call an elevator speech. Because this movement is perhaps more niche than many of our siblings, it's useful to have a ready-to-go pitch for what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. Since I'm attending a Methodist seminary, I've been around plenty of wonderfully curious folks, unfamiliar with this tradition, so I've had a chance to put mine to the test. It's a harrowing task and truthfully an unfair expectation for us to carry. 
Of course, our faith can never be reduced to a 30-second blurb. But I've tried starting it off with letting them know my truest answer, that I can't tell you, I can only show you, so why don't you come with me to church one Sunday? This one's met with different levels of enthusiasm sometimes. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not trying to bring everyone to church with me, and I, I don't want to be confused for proselytizing a lot of the time, so all my elevator speeches end up feeling deeply lacking, like I'm doing a disservice to our movement. So I've been working on crafting the best one that I can for a while now. I used to start them off by saying that we are a creedless faith, that we know that we need not think alike to love alike, that we can be pretty suspicious of dogma, and that instead of gathering together to worship the same things, we gather in covenant with each other around a set of principles that change throughout time. I tell people that our covenant directs us now towards justice, towards love, towards respect, and towards spiritual growth through universal community. I think that these are all deeply important to our faith, and I think it sets folks up pretty well to understand what a service might look like, what our community might look and behave like. But though it might show what we look like, I, I don't know that it shows very well what our faith is. I've learned through these elevator speeches that belonging to a creedless faith is not that unique to our movement, actually. Our Baptist siblings, for example, are creedless as a denomination as well. Many Christian denominations are in their faith opposed to creeds, suspicious of limiting how they might experience and intellectualize divinity. And it's wonderful to recognize these points of overlap, but it doesn't really help me when I'm trying to let folks know what makes us unique. So in this journey towards an elevator pitch, I've learned through Reverend Meredith Garman that perhaps it's not our identity as a creedless faith that sets us apart, but that we're also a canonless faith. We as a faith community keep our canon open, trusting that we may find our spiritual development in many texts. While many other faiths keep a defined list of those texts that they consider divinely authored, divinely inspired, or just historically and theologically and organizationally important to their mission and to their faith, we don't keep a list like that. If you put enough UUs in a room together, you'll have plenty of issue getting, to them, get, getting them to agree on what divine means, not to mention what in this world is divinely inspired. So it works out for the best of us so far as a community invested not only in our own spiritual development, but that of our fellows in this world and in this church to keep that canon open. Our living tradition continues to find scripture not only in certain books, but in our lives, in our bodies, in the world around us, in the newspaper, and sometimes especially in the comics section. I find scripture in horror movies. I think horror, like science fiction that I've talked about so much this summer, can be a place of visionary fiction, where we can look around at the world and examine it from a new light, where we can sincerely ask ourselves, what is the worst that could happen, figure out how we might be able to deal with that. Horror can have really sophisticated social messages, and I think really great theology. It can ask questions of the theology that happens on its own in a church or in a school, asking, how should we feel next to a power so much greater than our own? Horror asks hard questions about the nature of good and evil, of sin and salvation. I'm a lifelong Unitarian Universalist, and I learned some things about faith kind of backwards, I think. Um, the Rocky Horror Picture Show became my favorite movie at just one year old. And then after that, when I learned the Jesus story, I said, oh, this guy's kind of like Dr. Frankenfurter. When I was taking Bible classes in seminary this past year, we did historical criticism to understand how the, the stories in the Bible changed and developed in time before they were organized into a canon, and how different authors or scribes took different liberties to, they thought, correct 
a story or to change its theme to reflect something more pressing to their contexts. When I saw many of the discrepancies in these stories, it made sense to me because that's just like the films in the Halloween franchise. <laughs> They also go back and fix the earlier sequels and change the mythologies around the main antagonist, Michael Myers. The Halloween movies are some of my favorites, part of the slasher genre, which, if you're unfamiliar, is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. These are the Friday the 13th and the Texas Chainsaw Massacres, the movies where a usually masked, usually man with a usually sharp object can't be defeated against a crew of usually teenagers. And I think they work a lot like scripture. That's what I like about slasher movies in particular. They work like myths. Wendy Doniger talks about how myths, myths work. There's the macro myth, and that's something like the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, where Eurydice is sent to the underworld and in order to rescue her, Orpheus must walk in front of her without looking back to make sure she's following. But he ends up not being able to help himself, and he turns around just to watch her disappear before his eyes. That's the macro myth. That's the, the myth at its largest and most general form. But each telling of it is called a micro myth. And that's where the story can get interesting, with all the smaller details that enrich the myth with context and with meaning making it relevant to different audiences or different authors. And I think that's how a lot of these slasher movies work, or really any kind of monster movie. There's the macro myth, like zombies, and then there's the micro myths, like George Romero's films, Night of the Living Dead, where the undead force a reluctant and interracial crew to cooperate for their collective safety, or his Dawn of the Dead, where those same creatures haunt a shopping mall, illustrating the dangers and dullings of capitalism and consumerism. They say that different kinds of horror movies become popular at different times based on current events. They reflect our collective fears and traumas and maybe try to offer some kind of catharsis through them. King Kong demonstrated the fear of the Great Depression wreaking havoc on industrialized society. After people in America were faced with war brought home by witnessing the 9-11 attack, horror reflected this too, and home invasion movies took off in popularity. Lately, since 2016 and the Trump election and rising fascist sympathy, I've seen so many movies addressing how easily even our loved ones can drift into mob violence, hatred, and bigotry in movies like Assassination Nation, Get Out, Halloween Kills, and in the Purge franchise. But I don't think it's enough to say that these movies reflect our fears. It would be a pretty boring genre if all they did was tell us what we know. No, horror films don't only reflect our fears, they, they create the monsters. They're not neutral. These modern myths that we create have a very real power over our collective imagination. I don't think monsters are created by a god like Poseidon with the Minotaur. Frankenstein was the doctor, not the creation after all. Like Mary Shelley tells us, people create monsters. Just like we create boxes to call movies like The Nightmare on Elm Street horror, but not Willy Wonka, and the chocolate factory. We also have to build boxes like these to call characters like the creature from the Black Lagoon monsters. We decide what's monstrous instead of fantastical. And when we make these calls, I, I think we're participating in theology. No, myths aren't neutral. As people of faith, we have an obligation to critically evaluate where we find monsters being made. And this obligation comes from what we deserve. We deserve to consent to our spiritual practices. So we deserve to know what theologies we're finding ourselves implicated in, which sacred texts we draw into our sacred canon. 
We don't consent to making monsters out of disability, which happens entirely too often in and outside of horror. We don't consent to making monsters out of people of color, and you can find this often enough on the news. No, our faith compels us towards counterculture, like Anna Levy Lyons tells us from our second reading. Our faith reminds us that the harsh, perilous, mighty matter is blessed, not wretched. And our monsters hold inherent worth and dignity too. Transgender people like myself have been made monsters many times. In Psycho, Sleepaway Camp, and Silence of the Lambs, we've been cast as deranged, envious, wrathful, perverted people. Mary Daly, the trans-exclusionary fem feminist philosopher, said that our trans bodies are monstrous like that of Frankenstein's monster, an unflattering conglomeration of medically applied mutilations set an uncanny valley apart from true or natural cisgender womanhood. We've been made monsters for sure. But what if we choose the side of the monster? The transgender theorist Susan Stryker argues that, yes, I am Frankenstein's monster, and I'm filled with the same righteous anger, the same sacred rage. She writes, hearken unto me, fellow creatures, I who have dwelt in a form unmatched with my desire, I offer you this warning. You are as constructed as me. The same anarchic womb has birthed us both. I call upon you to investigate your nature as I have been compelled to confront mine. I challenge you to risk abjection and flourish as well as I have. Heed my words and you may well discover the seams and sutures in yourself. I love many of those films that make people like me out to be monsters because I love the monsters. I love watching these films on my terms. It can be harrowing work to love the monster, to side with the monster, but it's work that we're capable of and it's worthy. As we journey towards spiritual wholeness, may we find the humanity that has always been part of every monster. In the spirit of liberation, may we try the same with those parts of ourselves we've learned to be monstrous to. And as we do so, may the dimensions of God be revealed to us through this blessed, universal, mighty, perilous, harsh matter. May it be so, and amen. Please rise and join with me in singing hymn number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal, Blue Boat Home.
Our benediction, the words of Asada Shakur. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love each other and support each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Go in peace. Thank you.